Hey all here OS Reviews, today we're taking a quick look at the Vasoon M30. This is a budget Android tablet with a 10.1 inch display. It is powered by the Rockchip RK3566 processor. This is a 64-bit quad-core processor clocked up to 1.8 gigahertz. This is not going to be a performance king, but still is a fitting choice for this tablet, which is priced at under 90 bucks. So again, super low cost, in fact, even less than what a comparable Amazon Fire 10 would cost you. Uh, what is impressive here though is you're getting three gigabytes of RAM which in a vacuum doesn't seem like a ton but again considering this price a lot of the other competitors would give you just two gigs this will just make things feel a little bit more fluid as you're jumping between apps it has 32 gigs of ROM which is again not a ton but you can expand that via a micro SD card up to 128 gigs typical dual band Wi-Fi along with Android 11 are built on in there's a quick user guide here along with a array of just a charging cable and a wall adapter. This is, by the way, using a standard USB Type-C cable as a 8 megapixel rear-facing camera along with a 2 megapixel one for video chatting. And yes, there is a factory applied screen protector when you first take it out of the box. There is still a film that is covering it to give you a little bit of extra protection. Now taking a closer look now at the design, overall the tablet is constructed out of polycarbonate plastic, but it doesn't actually feel too cheap or hollow. It is quite reminiscent of the aforementioned Amazon Fire tablets. There's kind of a more glossy finish at the back, and then the band here is sandwiched by a more coarse material. I wouldn't say it necessarily feels ultra premium because there's no metal materials being used, but definitely doesn't creak or cringe as you're holding it, and actually has a pretty good sense of uh, durability. If you drop it, it doesn't feel like it's gonna be too fragile, which is good. Now anyways, we do have access in the back here to the aforementioned eight megapixel lens. Top houses the micro SD card slot, as along with the Type-C port for charging and data. There are still stereo speakers on here which do actually have good placement, one on the left and one on the right side that will give you some separation, along with a standard 3.5mm headphone jack, a power key, and a volume rocker. As far as the front of the tablet is concerned, again this 10.1 inch display, it is an IPS panel, so viewing angles are not bad, but as a budget tablet, kind of expected, it's not fully laminated, meaning there is a little bit of a gap between the glass and the LCD underneath, which can cause a little bit more glare, uh, but still definitely not a bad quality screen for this price, at least colors do look pretty vibrant uh, for an IPS panel, and touch sensitivity also seems to be pretty good. Bezel sizes are, I would say, modest as well. They're not quite as large as on budget tablets of yesteryear, but they're also not quite as slim as on, let's say, something like an iPad Pro, but pretty good for this price. It is symmetrical looking. We are talking about a very clean version of Android 11, and it is the full version of Android, not Android Go. So you have access to all the typical gestures for navigation, and the standard Google utilities come pre-installed, including access to the Play Store. The battery life is also decent, uh, thanks to the 6,000 milliamp hour capacity battery coupled with the HD Plus resolution. This was sufficient to drive around six hours of screen on time, which was quite good, and in regular usage, this is definitely a device I could use for a few days before I needed to necessarily recharge it again, but obviously your mileage will vary depending on your screen brightness and how hard you're using the device. Now, in terms of memory, again, not a ton. There's about 23 gigs, which are free when you first take it out of the box. Uh, but luckily, there is that micro SD card to further supplement things. Now, this Rockchip processor, I think it's doing all right. I would say performance here is comparable to other maybe lower end chipsets, such as a Snapdragon 400 series device. So you will see some slight moments of hesitation occasionally as you are jumping between these bigger animations, as you can see there. But for the most part, it doesn't really freeze on you and things are still overall responsive enough. Camera on here is quite basic, but that's fine considering this is a tablet at the end of the day. Good enough to capture some important documents, for instance, you wanna share and preserve. And overall, again, as far as budget tablets are concerned, it will certainly do the job in a pinch. It is an autofocus lens at the very least, so you can get up close to different objects and things still look sharp enough for a, again, tablet camera. Front-facing camera, though, at two megapixels is definitely a little bit weaker. You tend to have to be in a relatively brightly lit environment for it to get the best result. So overall, as far as, again, the basics when it comes to just regular navigation, it certainly doesn't feel too shabby. Let's do a very quick web browsing test and see how it handles things. As expected for a budget tablet, you do have to wait a little longer for things to completely load, but The Verge is a pretty heavy page, lots of different videos and small text details, and overall, it's not bad. It may not be buttery smooth in terms of everything loading 
loading instantly when you first hit on the page, uh, but for the most part things are definitely still usable, and this large display just makes it a little bit more immersive as you are reading back content. Text for the most part still looks good enough, even if it's not going to be pin sharp compared to higher res screens, but at least colors do look quite good and it's definitely a more than usable experience. Again, with three gigabytes of RAM, you're able to do a little bit of more tabbed browsing and multitasking, not a ton, but if you are, let's say, opening up around four or five tabs, you can still generally hop between them. And now taking a closer look at how it fares with doing things like watching back YouTube videos and cranking up the speakers here for the sound. Right, so some takeaways here being that the speakers are not bad, especially since they give you that stereo separation. You do get a pretty nice effect as you're watching back clips and they can get plenty loud as well. It doesn't have a ton of depth, but not too tinny sounding either. And good to see that you always have a standard headphone jack or Bluetooth options if you prefer. Again, the colors of the display I think are a bit more impressive than I was expecting for this price range. Uh, however, definitely there's a bit more glare than I would like, but again, that's just a result of having a non-laminated screen. Although, like I said, if you are in a really dark environment, it doesn't become too problematic. You won't really notice any of that reflection anymore, but if you do have a bit more of sunlight around you, it can be something to keep in mind. Although if you pick up something like a matte screen protector, that might help, though you will also lose out a little bit in terms of the saturation of the display. So overall, for watching back videos, good enough, especially when you are using 720p, since that's the maximum output of the screen anyways, things are generally quite fast to load without much buffering going on. So again, fairly good in terms of the Wi-Fi reception strength and although you will find occasional moments of jumpiness as you're using the kind of apps here, for the most part things are still more than usable and doesn't feel too distracting. Last but not least, taking a quick look at how it fares with a bit of light gaming, especially with more simple and older titles, there's definitely no issues here. Uh, but of course it's always going to be an area of weakness on budget devices. It's going to be the horsepower of the GPU and the CPU, or it's just not going to be quite as strong as on more modern and uh, flagship products. But on here it's definitely not bad, though I will say that when you are doing a bit more gaming, especially for longer sessions, the left-hand side of the device gets a little bit more warm. Never too hot. I don't think I've experienced thermal throttling yet, which is good, but definitely know that it's not going to be you know, completely stress-free for this tablet. It really isn't the most powerful thing in the world, but if you are doing more light gaming, simpler titles, 2D style animations, it shouldn't have too many issues. Keep your expectations modest and you are a little bit more patient in terms of waiting for the games to load for the first time. Things after loading will remain decent maybe some small moments of drop frames as you can see there and obviously if you're playing things like PUBG or let's say Asphalt it's not going to be quite as good there. You would ideally want a more powerful CPU in those cases but again as long as you are patient with the tablet you have more modest expectations more casual gaming as well as maybe giving it to a child or a kid or again using it primarily for video consumption or browsing the web and that's going to be areas where I think it shines a little bit more. So that's more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Valsin M30. I serve as a nice alternative to something like a Fire 8 or Fire 10 at a similar if not slightly lower price and giving you a more stock version of Android. You can check out more details in the links down below if you're interested, but for now that's been our video, kind of representative of what a sub $100 tablet will get you here in 2022. That's been the 10.1 inch Valsin M30.